This lecture is entitled Imaging of the Nasopharynx, but it's subtitled Nasopharyngeal Carcinoma and a bunch of other stuff. Because nasopharyngeal carcinoma is the big diagnosis we're looking for when we are evaluating the nasopharynx. However, there's a ton of other things, all of which can mimic nasopharyngeal carcinoma, so it's worth knowing the differential that feeds off of that one diagnosis. We're going to start by learning the anatomy of the nasopharynx and talk about our approach to imaging of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Then we're going to learn about the staging of nasopharyngeal carcinoma, not because I think that it's important for radiologists to provide a stage, but it's important for us to understand how the staging is performed so that we can make sure that we feed all of our relevant information into the multidisciplinary conference when they come up with a formal staging. Uh, we'll talk both about the primary tumor and the nodal disease. We'll briefly mention the differences between the American Joint Committee on Cancers version 7 and version 8 in the, in the staging of the disease. Uh, and then the, uh, the second half of this lecture is really all the other lesions, that any of which can look just like nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So let's start a review of the anatomy. Uh, the red arrow here is pointing to a, an object that's extending out into the nasopharynx. How do we know we're in the nasopharynx here? Because right in front of us is the nasal cavity, and right behind us is the clivus. That's where the nasopharynx lives. The red arrow is pointing to an object that extends out into the nasopharynx obliquely at about 45 degrees from either side. This is the torus tuberius. The torus tuberius is a cartilaginous cap that covers the opening of the eustachian tube and props it open so that the eustachian tube doesn't just flop close. Torus tuberius. Just lateral to the torus tuberius is the opening of the eustachian tube. Okay, so that's what the torus tuberius is doing, is cupping over that opening of the eustachian tube. Behind the torus tuberius is the fossa of Rosenmuller. This is a potential space formed by two layers of mucosa. You can watch the mucosa come back, make a U-turn, and come back around again. So it's just a little pocket back there. This is a common location for nasopharyngeal carcinoma to arise. What are those two black lines? Those two black lines are the pterygoid plates. Right, the pterygoid plates, there's a medial and lateral pterygoid plates to which the uh, pterygoid muscles attach, and the pterygoid plates extend up and, uh, and connect to the skull base. What is circled here is a muscle, and these are the prevertebral muscles. Depending on how close you get to the skull base, these may be longus coli muscles or longus capitis muscles, um, but we'll just lump them together and call them the prevertebral muscles for the sake of this discussion in the nasopharynx. If we come out lateral to those prevertebral muscles, we have a circle of, uh, of vascular structures here. This is the neurovascular space, or carotid space, if you like, and um, this is where the internal carotid artery, the jugular vein, the vagus nerve at this level, uh, the uh, ninth and 11th cranial nerves as well, are, are coming through. These arrows are pointing to a bony structure, the clivus, which uh, is the boundary between the intracranial vault and the nasopharynx. This red line outlines the parapharyngeal fat. If you have already heard the lecture on anatomy of the neck, this is going to be a very familiar and important structure to you because it demarcates all of the surrounding structures, um, but it's useful here in the setting of, the, of nasopharyngeal carcinoma as well, parapharyngeal fat. Coming anteriorly, we're going to see the muscles that are attached to those pterygoid muscles, the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles attached to the pterygoid plates. Uh, those are two of the four muscles of mastication, the others being the masseter muscle out here and the temporalis muscle, which is just forming there, but it's going to splay up over the side of the skull. So that's half the muscles of mastication right there, the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. All right, now let's turn our attention to nasopharyngeal carcinoma itself.
there are two forms of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. The more common one is the endemic form of nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is endemic in East Asia. This is a non-keratinizing, non undifferentiated form of squamous cell carcinoma, and Epstein-Barr virus is a causative agent in the formation of this disease. There's another form of nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is seen sporadically and rarely in North America. This form of nasopharyngeal carcinoma does not have a uniform histopathology like the endemic form does, and it does not have uniform causality the way the endemic form does. All of these forms together are treated the same way, though. They're treated non-surgically with chemoradiation. Radiation is the mainstay of treatment for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So how do we image nasopharyngeal carcinoma? Well, there's an easy answer here, MRI. So MRI is the preferred modality for the staging of the primary tumor. It just does a much better job for showing the extent of disease into bone, into soft tissue. Sometimes you end up with a CT, uh, usually before a definitive diagnosis has been made, or in patients who are unable to undergo MRI. What about PET-CT? Is that useful? Well, it's not useful for the primary tumor, really, but it is useful for identifying distant disease. When do you need it? You need it when you have an advanced local tumor, uh, that is a T3 or T4 primary tumor. When you have nodal disease, N1's enough. Once you have a node, there's likely enough that you have distant disease that's worth checking. Or if you, there are other clinical signs that suggest metastatic disease, a classic example being elevation of liver enzymes because um, hepatic metastasis metastases are reasonably common. Now, don't you feel sorry for the patient who has to undergo this PET-CT in addition to the MRI of the skull base? Well, if you have a PET-MR scanner, you can do it all as a single examination. Take care of the primary tumor in the nasopharynx, take care of distant disease uh, all, all at the same time. So if you happen to have a PET-MR scanner, nasopharyngeal carcinoma is an ideal disease to be staged with that modality. Let's turn to the staging of nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and we'll start with the primary tumor. So T0 means that there's no primary tumor identified. Now you're asking yourself, if I don't see a tumor, how do I know that this is a nasopharyngeal carcinoma and not a primary starting from somewhere else? I'll let you think about that. That answer is coming later in the lecture. T1 disease is confined disease. It's confined to the nasopharynx, obviously, but we allow it to go into the oropharynx or the nasal cavity, that is the adjacent mucosal regions. If it is in the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and nasal cavity, then it is still T1. Once you reach the parapharyngeal spaces, that is um, the pterygoid and prevertebral muscles, the parapharyngeal fat, and the carotid space, then we're T2. The, all of these terms are going to be very familiar and comfortable to the people who have already seen the lecture on uh, neck anatomy. So if this is at all confusing, I highly recommend that lecture. Once the disease reaches the bones, then we're into T3. Which bones are likely to be involved? The skull base, and I'm talking about the clivus here. Um, I'm talking about the spine, C1 and C2 anterior arches, the paranasal sinuses, and those pterygoid plates we were just talking about. If you reach any of those bony structures, T3. T4 disease involves distant soft tissues. Um, by distant, I mean intracranial. If you go all the way through the clivus and find yourself into the dura of the posterior fossa, that's intracranial spread. If you have invaded or if there's perineal spread along a cranial nerve, if you involve the parotid, the orbit, or the hypopharynx, all T4. Notice that we allow the oropharynx. You're still in T1 if you're just in the oropharynx, but as soon as you get down to that hypopharynx, boom, T4 disease. I'm going to show you a bunch of examples of disease in each of these regions. Let's start with T1 disease. Here is an enhancing tumor, and you can see that it completely surrounds the torus tuberius. It really fills out the fossa of Rosenmuller compared to, compared to the mucosa, mucosa without tumor on the other side. And it's filling out the opening of the eustachian tube as well. Extensive disease, but all confined to the nasopharynx. This is T1 disease. Here's another example of T1 disease. 
the key here is recognizing that these prevertebral muscles are symmetric and normal in appearance, that all of the fat, the parapharyngeal fat, is intact, nice white line around it. So although there is a bulky mass within the center of the nasopharynx, it hasn't spread to anywhere else. Here's a really important sign that we can look for on unenhanced T1 weighted images, and that's the white line sign. If you can see a white line separating the prevertebral muscles from the tumor itself, that's an intact fat plane, and that's a really good indicator that you have not advanced beyond the nasopharynx. So this is still a T1 disease. You might argue it's knuckling slightly into the nasal cavity, through the coina into the nasal cavity. That's okay. Nasal cavity still one of the adjacent mucosal surfaces, still T1. This next tumor might be hard to even recognize at first, but if you look carefully, you can see that there's disruption of the normal fat planes on the left, and that is our tumor right there. Now, I don't see that nice white line that is protecting the prevertebral muscles, but everything else looks pretty good. Let's switch over to the post-contrast imaging and see if that helps. Uh, here, this is really interesting. Now you can see that that prevertebral muscle there is entirely filled with enhancing tumor uh, right up to the point where it hits the, uh, actually the C1 arch at this level. So we've gotten ourselves into the muscles now. We've started to show some T2 tumors. Here's another uh, mass centered in the nasopharynx. Doesn't look too bad, right? I'm still seeing a lot of good anatomy all around the outside, but what about this? What about this invasion of the, of the prevertebral musculature? Look at the shape, the normal shape of the prevertebral muscles here on the left. Notice how that has been disrupted on the right. There is invasion back into that prevertebral muscle, not through and through, but into the anterior half of that prevertebral muscle visible on the T2 weighted image. A, uh, uh, this one is stage T2. So here's an example where you might say, oh, I can see the white line all the way around. The white line sign, we're great. There's no invasion. Uh, but what's going on out here? This tumor has extended out laterally and has surrounded the carotid artery. This is what it's supposed to look like. The tumor has surrounded the carotid artery, and we know that once we get into that neurovascular space, we are a T2 lesion. Here's another example of a T2 lesion. You can see that this uh, large enhancing mass has uh, extended through the prevertebral musculature, undermined the prevertebral musculature. Has it gotten far enough out laterally to be a problem? Well, it hasn't quite reached the pterygoid plates, so we're still in T2 territory. Uh, another example, same basic idea, coming out laterally. We're all the way out to the internal carotid artery. We're into that neurovascular space, so that's going to be T2. But we haven't invaded into the bones of the clivus or of the pterygoid plates, so we're still just T2. Bulky tumor, this time on a CT. Once again, you're wondering how far out does it go? Well, it probably invades that prevertebral muscles. It definitely surrounds the carotid artery out here, um, but uh, it doesn't reach into the far soft tissues and it doesn't seem to have eroded the bone. Obviously, you want to check your bone windows. Still in the T2 arena. Here's an example that might be a little bit confusing. This tumor has surrounded the torus tuberius, and it looks like it might be extending all the way out into the pterygoid muscles out here and through the, uh, through the pterygoid uh, plates. Uh, but be careful. Remember that there is a normal pterygoid venous plexus that is variable in size and sits right out here among the pterygoid muscles and uh, between the pterygoid plates. Don't be confused. Don't be confused into thinking that that is tumor. It's just a venous plexus, and you've got to get used to what that looks like. It can be very asymmetric, very confusing. Once again, carotid space involved here. Okay.
How do we get to T3? We get into the bones. That's how we get to T3. Here's an example of a nasopharyngeal carcinoma that's extended back, and you can see the clivus is expanded and abnormally enhancing. Once that clivus is involved, we're going to call it a T3 lesion. But we can see that although it's expanded, the posterior table is still intact, and we can see an intact dura underneath that. So we're not into the posterior fossa yet. We're just in the bone T3. Here's another example of a T3 lesion. This time, this you might think at first, oh, this soft tissue is just out into the prevertebral muscles and, and, and into the uh, carotid sheath. We're doing okay here, maybe a little bit more lateral. But what about this enhancement right here? Those are occipital condyles. We are into the bones of the skull base. If you see involvement of the C1 arch or involvement of the occipital condyle, we're into bone at that point. And here's the transverse process of C1 into the bone. That's indicative of T3. Remember, bones are T3. Okay, how do we get all the way to T4? We get inside the skull. That's how. So here's a... Um, a large necrotic mass. It's completely encasing the internal carotid arteries, and you can see that it has extended back through and through the clivus. Now it's in the posterior fossa, abutting the, um, the, the basilar artery, and you can see the middle cranial fossa also involved bilaterally. That's inside the skull. That's T4. Here's another way you can get to be T4, and that's perineural spread. This lesion is coming out laterally. It has managed to find its way into the pterygopalatine fossa, and it has found its way onto V2 and crawled back into uh, the Gasserian ganglion in Meckel's cave. That perineural spread, that renders it T4. Here's another example of perineural spread. You can see disease spreading up and filling Meckel's cave. Compare that to the normal cave on the other side. And if you look in the coronal plane, you can see it spreading along foramen rotundum, that enhancement abnormal in foramen rotundum, perineural spread, T4 disease. A more dramatic example of that where Meckel's cave is completely filled, the cavernous sinus completely filled, and extension along the dura and the floor of the middle cranial fossa. Another example of advanced disease. Now we're through the paranasal sinuses, and, and now we've extended out laterally, and we've gotten into the infratemporal fossa, um, and, and so this is now extension of disease. Um, uh, out, out to the distant soft tissues, T4 disease. This concludes part one of the lecture on imaging of the nasopharynx.